I'm uh, Richard Vetter. I'm speaking from my office at Ohio University with the president of Purdue University, Mitch uh, Daniels, about that institution's remarkable record of innovation uh, in recent years. Uh, and so he is speaking, of course, from his office at Purdue. So welcome, uh, President Daniels. I'm glad to be here and appreciate the invitation. Uh, maybe I misread your vita. Uh, it seems like you've had relatively little or no classroom experience as a professor, no previous leadership role in a university as a dean or a provost. Do you think uh, a lack of such prior university experience has been a disadvantage for you? Or rather, do you think uh, we need more campus leaders with substantial sort of real world business or political experience? Well, I certainly won't claim it was an advantage, uh, Richard, but uh, I think it was a disadvantage in some ways, but not a fatal one. And it had, it, and it had its upsides, really, to come to any job. Uh, with uh, what the uh, uh, Chinese call young eyes, that is to say, uh, not, not burdened by uh, old uh, uh, tribal habits and preconceptions. So I had an awful lot to learn. I'm still learning. But I worked as hard as I could at that. And in the meantime, I do think that on various occasions, uh, there is uh, some uh, upside to uh, uh, looking at things in a different way, not understanding why we can't do uh, X or why uh, we uh, uh, must uh, continue doing Y. Uh, it seems to me the single most uh, uh, interesting accomplishment of Purdue is that you haven't raised tuition fees for, for students in the five years that you've been there. Well, most universities have risen them anywhere from two to four, even five percent uh, a year. Uh, at the same time, you're announcing, or you did announce early in your tenure there, a sizable increase in the number of faculty in the STEM uh, fields. How did you do it? Did you uh, draw down endowments? Uh, did you uh, cash reserves? Did you talk the state legislature into giving you uh, obscene amounts of money? <laughs> uh, did you go more into debt or, or were there some other uh, means that you did? Did you pare down, for example, the size of the administrative bureaucracy? Tell us how you did it. Well, it was, I was going to answer none of the above till you got to the very last uh, uh, question. And yes, there, we've, we've done what we can to, to uh, uh, concentrate resources on the, on the core functions of the university, teaching and research. Uh, and not on administration, but none of the rest of that applies. We're getting less money uh, from the state of Indiana than we were. I, I want to hasten to add, Indiana has been uh, third in the nation, last I looked, in, in maintaining overall support for higher ed. But we have a performance fund, funding formula that looks backwards, and Purdue is uh, 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 suffering the consequences of the way that formula works. So we right now. So we've been getting less money from the state. We, our cash reserves are bigger, not smaller than before. We have raised uh, salaries at least at par with our peers in a couple years uh, more. Uh, and we have, the, we have added faculty, as you mentioned. We have, uh, uh, we have not shifted to, as many schools have, so-called contingent faculty doing it on the cheap. We have the, at 74 or 5 percent, we have the third highest tenured a ratio of tenured professors of any American university. So it's none of those uh, things. We simply have tried to build a, a culture of, of uh, economy uh, here. Uh, you know, Richard, uh, this is a wonderful uh, 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 place full of views on every subject you can name, just as a university should be. But one thing that I would say everybody here agrees on is that we want Purdue University to remain affordable. Uh, to students of all backgrounds who can meet our standards. And so we've asked everybody to support this uh, policy and pitch in. Uh, I have to say, uh, this, uh, much as in government uh, and in business, uh, if the top line goes flat, uh, when you draw a line or it's drawn for you, uh, people sharpen their pencils and do things they probably should have done sooner. And so I often say that economies, and we've practiced a lot of them, if, from procurement to modernizing our health care plan, um, 
uh, to uh, watching more carefully uh, how we build capital projects, that uh, economy has contributed to the freeze, but the freeze has contributed to economy or efficiency also. So it hasn't been anything magic about it, and uh, uh, we are very, very confident that we have been investing in Purdue's future and building Purdue's future, not um, uh, damaging it in any way. Well, that's great to hear. Uh, I, I was delighted to hear that you've made some parring of a uh, reduction in administrative staff along the way as well. Uh, faculty tend to be always chronic complainers about administration. You need a university administration to make the school work. But my experience in 53 years of teaching is the ratio of teachers to administrators has constantly fallen over time. And I'm glad to hear that Purdue might be doing something about that. Well, we have much more to do. I don't go around bragging, really, about the, the economies we've affected so far. Um, I think we've uh, been... Um, there's plenty more, uh, more uh, places I can see uh, just walking around our campus where we uh, uh, could uh, become much more efficient. And I will say that uh, we've, had, we've looked closely at this administrative uh, uh, job situation. And one does, ha at a school like ours, one really has to be um, uh, discriminating about this because many of the so-called administrative jobs support the research that we do here on a very, very large scale. We've been setting records for research at Purdue, uh, well over $400 million worth last year. And uh, many of those jobs are, uh, are directly involved in supporting that research. They're paid for by the research. Uh, what we have to work on is uh, what, when we have some very antiquated old systems here that are purely administrative and um, uh, we, uh, we uh, have uh, a whole lot left to do. Well, that's a great story. Uh, let's switch uh, gears just a bit. Uh, I think the higher education world was absolutely astonished when Purdue uh, announced it was buying one of the leading uh, for-profit higher education providers, Kaplan. Were you accused of diluting Purdue's reputation for high quality education or of ignoring, say, the faculty's traditionally very important role in curricular matters? And I guess more importantly, why did you do it? And more generally, what do you see as the future of broad-based, internet-based instruction? Because we can't see that future uh, is one of the two principal reasons for the uh, action that we took. The first, the first of our reasons and the largest is that we're a land-grant school. A lot of people don't know that, but um, uh, we uh, were put here to expand and democratize higher education uh, by uh, the Morrill Act in the, back in the Abe Lincoln era. And uh, we think uh, that there is a very large universe of people in this economy and in this uh, era uh, who didn't go to college the first time or started and didn't complete. Uh, who the nation needs, uh, better educated in order to succeed, and who as individuals deserve a chance at a better life that, that effective higher education can bring. So just as we expanded our original mission after World War II by opening regional campuses, which were criticized in exactly the same way uh, as uh, diluting the the uh, reputation or brand and as uh, uh, offering uh, uh, some... Um, uh, uh, inferior uh, sort of education to people who didn't really deserve it. Um, now we believe that uh, uh, we need to reach those 36 million, somebody needs to reach those 36 million Americans who started college and didn't finish. And in a knowledge economy, uh, uh, can do more and the nation needs them to do more. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, and you uh, surfaced it a minute ago, uh, we don't know how fast or in what directions online and uh, distance education, digital education is going to grow, but we know it's not going to get any smaller. And we wanted to have that uh, in our repertoire. We wanted to be equipped here at Purdue to uh, uh, serve those markets effectively. So serving new markets and, and possibly bringing existing, lots of existing Purdue academic content uh, to people uh, around the country or beyond for that matter, uh, we, uh, we think will be one product of this action. Great, yeah. By the way, I, I knew Andy, know Andy Rosen and the others who 
been involved with Kaplan from the beginning. Uh, uh, and I, I always thought of it as a pretty first-class operation within the, that whole uh, sector of higher ed, personally. Uh, yeah. well, let, me just, let me just say that the questions about, uh, uh, about uh, the, the, this uh, transaction are, were the right ones. We asked, them, we asked the same ones, but we did a half a year of very careful uh, investigation and diligence. And you're right about Kaplan. They were the best uh, in their sector. They protect students in a way that, frankly, people at our two schools don't. Uh, you can start there and go for weeks, and uh, uh, if you find it's not for you, you can you can withdraw at no cost, for instance. So um, they are people of high character, very idealistic about their mission, and we look forward to being associated with them. Yeah, that, that's my impression, too. Uh, you seem to believe that universities will, per will perform better if they have some skid in the game. That is to say that uh, they share financially in both the successes and the failures of their students, and for that matter, their academic researchers. It seems to me that Purdue's decision to invest in its own students through income share agreements, or ISIAs, sort of exemplifies this. And would you explain uh, to the ALEC audience uh, the Purdue ISA program and why you're doing it? And while you're at it, would you maybe also reflect as a former governor and speaking to state legislators, would you, uh, what do you think about the idea of state governments themselves generally getting in the invest business of investing in their own students in their states through ISA type programs? An income share agreement, uh, it's not a new idea. It's been around for 50 years or more. It's in effect in some South American countries that uh, do not have uh, government-subsidized loans as we do. And I do usually describe it as, the ec as an equity alternative to student debt. In this case, the risk shifts, uh, as it does in the case of equity, from the, uh, the student, who is not a borrower, uh, to the investing uh, person or uh, entity. Uh, if the student's uh, career goes really well, the investor will get a return. If not, the loss rests with the investor and not the student. You know, this is just the latest extension of our attempt at Purdue to lower the student debt burden on our, on our graduates as far as we possibly can. It's now lower than it was in 2004 in total dollars, even though we have more students. Uh, it's down about 30% during the period of this freeze, which uh, is uh, you know, in its fifth year and going to continue at least one more year. Uh, when you couple that with reductions we've made in the cost of room and board and books, um, it'll be less expensive in uh, nominal dollars to go to Purdue in 2019 than it was in 2012. And that has quite naturally led to a uh, sharp decline in the total amount of debt our students leave with. Now we come to income share agreements, which uh, have already taken a couple million dollars more um, uh, out of the debt total. And as we enter our second year, we're trying to get to a scale where we can all determine what the, uh, how well they work and what the uh, uh, demand for them among students will be. Your question about states getting in the act is an interesting one. I, I don't know yet what to think about it. We are trying to road test this uh, concept. And if we can create enough uh, uh, borrowing history or repayment history, uh, get to a reasonable enough scale along with other schools which have been contacting us and say they might want to set up uh, ISA programs of their own, uh, legislators and others will have something to look at that tells them whether it might make sense to, uh, to, uh, to jump in. But uh, I'll just say that the wind is open at Purdue for investments by uh, funds, and uh, one of those that did invest with us is a uh, is a Indiana State government affiliated. Well, that's great. Uh, I, I've been a great advocate of these programs for years. Uh, how well they work in totality, of course, we don't know yet. We uh, they're uh, somewhat embryonic within the U.S., but they have seemed to work elsewhere. And I, I'm delighted that you're doing this. Uh, by the way, you mentioned. Can I just let me just make one more uh, statement? I think that about it. You, you, I think you made a really important point that uh, when you mentioned skin in the game, that higher education has lacked for accountability. Um, 
it's one reason I believe, and others do, that that the uh, uh, that, uh, universities have been able to raise their cost year after year after year. No one's been keeping score. There's not been a measurement of quality. And in, in fact, people have associated a higher sticker price with greater quality. If it costs more, it must be uh, better. But there's no proof of that. And so I think in a variety of ways, ISAs could be one. Another is that, uh, um, as, as, as some of us think, that the federal the government should uh, uh, put colleges uh, on the hook for at least a small percentage of the loan defaults that their uh, graduates uh, or non-graduates uh, uh, commit, and uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of, of shared burden there right, might go a long way toward making certain that uh, everybody uh, works harder at at educating young people better than today. President Dan, you mentioned uh, in the answer to the previous question, textbooks briefly. Uh, I'm using uh, a, a textbook this semester, I'm actually holding it up, uh, that the students, uh, if, you, uh, if they paid the full price, would be paying $250 for it. Uh, and uh, textbook prices have risen much more than the prices of other books. Uh, over, uh, I've actually graphed it. It's amazing. Other books, when you crack for inflation, have actually declined in price, particularly when you take account of new technologies, which uh, uh, e-books and so on. And yet, textbook prices are going. What is Purdue doing about this uh, to restrain the growth of this major financial burden on students? We're doing what we can. The best I uh, can understand the situation, it suffers from a lack of competition at two levels, a lack of competition among producers who have been able, I think, to, to uh, maintain or even uh, raise prices uh, uh, monopolistically, as you pointed out. And uh, also at the local level, there were only two bookstores, two options uh, here uh, at our campus. So we introduced a new option. We worked with Amazon, and we have two... Uh, really space-age facilities on campus. Student can order books and have them to, uh, in a locker waiting the next uh, morning. And uh, the average savings has uh, been 30% so far. So we're doing what we can. I do think there, a, a big problem still remains in the control that a very limited number of companies have over the uh, original product. You know, us professors, we pick textbooks without any consideration whatsoever of the cost. I mean, speaking for myself and I think most of my colleagues, we don't think about that. You know, that's someone else's problem. And uh, uh, I think it would be good for us to have a little more consciousness of that problem for students ourselves. I think when I started teaching 53 years ago, I think my textbook was $7 or some <laughs> credible amount. Uh, uh, We've been talking mostly about college costs and related issues, but it, it appears uh, uh, that on so many campuses, there's a far more fundamental problem that strikes at the very heart of what a good university is all about. Uh, namely, you know, effective universities are places where all sorts of ideas uh, can be freely discussed without fear of uh, intimidations and so on. And yet we have riots and demonstrations at schools like Yale and Berkeley and Missouri that suggest this isn't always the case. So I guess the question is, what is Purdue doing to permit or even encourage a lively discourse, a peaceful discourse on campus? And uh, uh, do you have any recommendations on that for uh, uh, legislators? Should they be getting involved, passing state legislation that might uh, encourage universities to support a, an atmosphere allowing free speech, a protection of First Amendment rights. Here at Purdue, we have very strong views about this. We changed the, a few policies that we, that we had that were, were less than, uh, I would say, uh, 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 ideal in the, in the eyes of free speech advocates. We are now one of the few um, a blue ribbon, so to speak, uh, campuses in, uh, by the, uh, in the estimation of those who, who rank uh, schools this way. Uh, our trustees are, uh, passed a very uh, a strong statement. We um, copied it from the University of Chicago. I, 
I thought it was so well written that we couldn't do any better. And, and um, we've now labeled it the, the Chicago Principles and urged other schools to adopt the very same language. Uh, but, it is, uh, but our trustees uh, did so and uh, have made it plain that we're going to have open inquiry here at Purdue. We're going to protect speech we like and speech we hate. And that, uh, uh, that's, what, that's what a place like ours, uh, particularly a public institution like ours, is obligated to do constitutionally. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that for now we've uh, had uh, a, a positive environment and had all sorts of, uh, of uh, speakers uh, on campus. We have every flavor of opinion among our faculty. None of our faculty have, have been harassed in their classroom or otherwise uh, intimidated uh, from teaching whatever it is they think is, is appropriate. But um, we know we, those, those sorts of things are, un, are unfortunately uh, extant in society today and, and we can't assume we'll be immune. You know, Richard, I've, I've said very often that if other schools want to disgrace themselves by disinviting speakers or allowing um, uh, people simply trying to voice an opinion to be uh, verbally or physically intimidated, that's their problem. But if we're raising up a generation with an upside down view of the First Amendment, and there are now evidence that says that sadly high percentages of young people think it's just fine to uh, uh, silence someone who is speaking in a way they find offensive. Or even 20% in one poll thought violence was acceptable. If uh, we're raising up a bunch of little authoritarians um, in the next generation, then that's everybody's problem. And um, now whether legislators or legislatures should wade into this, I guess my first reaction is it shouldn't be necessary. This is a job for trustees uh, uh, who have the authority at schools, public and private, to make the rules and enforce them. And uh, uh, you know, uh, I would like to think that a, a resumption of, of uh, frankly, adult behavior on the part of, of uh, governing boards who have too often been uh, complacent or timid about uh, these things would be the, uh, the uh, appropriate remedy where, where we've got problems. Amen, amen, amen. I love that. Uh, uh, and I wish we had more universities express that. The Purdue uh, Chicago principles have been, uh, of course, agreed to by some other schools. And I think there's been a growing recognition that something needs to be done. And we appreciate Purdue's leadership uh, in that. Now, s switching topics entirely uh, differently, I heard a nasty rumor about Purdue. Uh, namely, that the Purdue Boilermakers are transitioning into the P Purdue Brewmeisters, and that Purdue is entering the beer business with Purdue Gold. Uh, now, is this true? And if so, isn't it going a bit far afield for a university to get involved in brewery? Well, we don't think so. Uh, it uh, is... Uh... Uh, part of our agricultural tradition, uh, starting oh, two or three decades ago, we helped the Midwest uh, develop a, a winery a business. And here too, uh, it started with Purdue Science, trying to help farmers in the Midwest grow hops, which if you didn't know, do not grow uh, naturally well at all in places like Indiana or Ohio, uh, but are now much in demand because of a growing craft beer industry and so forth. And so uh, here you have uh, some Purdue scientists working in agricultural engagement, the original assignment of land-grant schools, taking new technology, growing uh, practices and so forth out to farmers. And, um, and then we had, uh, there's a local uh, brewery run by a Purdue uh, graduate who uh, uh, is, uh, is making the stuff for us. So the Purdue Gold, which by the way, I can testify as the quality control officer on this project, is a, is a tremendous uh, addition to the nation's uh, 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 repertoire of loggers uh, is uh, is the output of that, but we think it's consistent with our uh, uh, with our mission and a little bit of fun too. Yeah, why not? 
Uh, great. Uh, let's uh, get away from Purdue a little bit and ask a sort of more general question. Uh, in the last several years, the last half dozen years or so, uh, the numbers suggest that total post-secondary enrollments in the U.S. have actually fallen slightly, not so much at the traditional four-year schools, but if you look at the totality of the numbers, some expect that trend to continue uh, this fall and even beyond. And as you know, of course, the for-profits seeking businesses within the higher ed uh, uh, universities have had a tough time. It, it strikes me that in profit-seeking businesses, poor performance usually leads firms to close or merge with stronger competitors. Uh, is this actually starting to happen to some extent in higher education despite all the government subsidies? Uh, is the enrollment decline that, uh, uh, that we have been seeing, you think it might be going to continue for a while? Is it worrisome? Is it something state governments should be thinking about and maybe reassessing some of their own investments in higher ed? How should uh, universities uh, uh, meet this challenge? I think that we should all be uh, sober in the face of, first of all, demographic reality, the number of traditional college, uh, traditional age college uh, uh, the students is going to, to uh, uh, flatten or grow very slowly over the next years. And within that number, a uh, growing percentage uh, are coming from backgrounds which at least historically, and, uh, and coming from uh, K-12 environments, which historically have not gotten um, uh, young people ready for real college work. So uh, the markets uh, we've traditionally operated in are going to grow slowly, uh, if at all. And yes, we're already starting to see a shakeout. It, it started with schools you might not even have heard of. It's beginning to find its way into schools that uh, have not been able to compete successfully. Our nearest neighbor here at Purdue, a really fine uh, smaller school named St. Joseph's, uh, unfortunately is closing uh, this year. And um, they are not alone. So there will probably be um, some uh, uh, continuing I think uh, uh, a reduction in the total number of institutions and the assignment for those of us uh, in, in responsible for, for places like, uh, uh, like ours is to produce a high quality, affordable product, and deliver value. Here at Purdue, we, we always talk about higher education at the highest proven value. And uh, I think that'll increasingly be the term of competition which, where it has not always been in the past. The other thing is uh, what we don't know is whether uh, uh, people, and we hope we can be uh, among that number, will be able to devise really effective uh, and uh, cost-effective ways to reach this enormous audience of people who are not traditional college age, who are older than that, didn't finish or didn't start college, but uh, are um, with the right sort of uh, uh, technologies uh, can and ha can add uh, uh, education to whatever they uh, have today and can do it even though they are all balancing uh, work and family obligations. If that happens, and I hope it does, that uh, then um, uh, we'll be better off as a country and uh, higher ed in total, will uh, will grow and not uh, and not uh, stagnate. Well, this has been a marvelous conversation, uh, President Daniels, and on behalf of Alec, uh, let me thank you uh, for this stimulating, uh, illuminating discussion. I, frankly, I'm speaking personally. I wish more American universities were led by people like you. I would note, uh, uh, putting in a plug for Purdue here. Uh, that the Wall Street Journal in its most recent rankings of colleges uh, has Purdue ranked fifth among uh, public universities in the United States, which no doubt is at least in part due to your leadership. And I want to thank you again for helping state legislators who are the main audience of this uh, uh, little discussion. Uh, to help them make uh, informed decisions in providing our uh, nation with better and more efficient 
institutions of higher education. So thank you very much. I enjoyed being here very much. And I just want to say to the, the, those in the audience that appreciate their attention to this issue, much like those governing boards I talked about, I think the right uh, uh, attitude toward our higher ed is not one of hostility, but one of uh, uh, support for the mission. It's critical nature in, uh, in um, uh, strengthening and preserving the strength of our country, but to insist on higher standards across the board and, uh, and an accountability system that makes them more likely. So thanks for having me and for all you do.